Five races into the 2023 F1 season and we've had some outstanding drives from Max Verstappen, Fernando Alonso and Sergio Perez just to name a few. But today we're going to be focusing on some of the drivers who have shown while not at the front of the grid. And joining me to do that is host of the F2 show, it's the fantastic Fraser Ford. Fraser, welcome back to the show, how are you? Thank you, yeah, no, thank you for having me. Yeah, really good, uh, really, you know, excited for, for what's to come, uh, really excited to be on the podcast, but also, you know, it's been a good start to the season, and I'm really excited to, to talk about what's happened so far, and uh, some highlights of the season, some drivers that have done really well, so yeah, no, thank you for having me, really excited. Excellent, and just before we kick off, um, what did you make of the driver intros in Miami? Just get your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, they were something, weren't they? What was that about? I mean, I, I personally, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't a fan, I'd say, but I kind of also understand that America do things differently, don't they? And we kind of have to embrace the culture, right? If we're, if we're going to these US races, uh, you know, that, you, if they ha want to put their stamp on things, that's fair enough, and that, that's, that's the way they're going to do things. So, um, yeah, I, I, the thing for me was when the... The, the drivers just, they didn't seem comfortable in that situation, did they, at all? With some of the drivers, Nick DeRees, for example, he walked out so quick, he, you could tell, he just wanted that over and done with straight away, right? So, um, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, you had to cringe a little bit, you had to laugh a little bit, um, but, uh, yeah, no. Uh, what, did you, what did you think? What was, uh, yeah, what was your opinion? Uh, it felt like WWE, to be honest, um, but without all the fireworks and the cool intro music, which I think if, if, you, if you went like the full hog and allowed the, the drivers to have a little bit more customization to it, it would work. I think it would also be much better if they didn't do it 20 minutes before they're about to start the race. But I, I understand why they do it then, because that's when most of the fans are going to be congregating to their seats to see them. But then surely part of the, the, the getting people to their seats quicker is saying, oh, we're going to have a big driver presentation, you know, 45 minutes before the race. So, you know, it's like with anything, it's trial and error at the end of the day, I think. So this one hasn't gone down well, but there is scope to use it in different places. So, you know, take the good bits, get rid of the bad, refine it, and hopefully it'll start to please a few more people. So let's talk about those drivers who haven't been at the front, but have still stood out. Now, for everyone else's benefit, we've chosen three drivers. We haven't told each other who they are so we're going into this totally blind um, so we could have the same three names we could have two names that are the same we could have no names that are the same um, but none of the drivers you're going to hear us talk about today drive a Red Bull a Mercedes a Ferrari an Aston Martin and they're not called Lando Norris um, the reason I excluded Lando Norris is we all know just how good Lando is and if you put him in the Red Bull he's giving Max Verstappen a very hard time so before we start with our own picks, uh, Tom Downey from the Grid Talk podcast has picked Zhou Guanyu as his driver who stood out this season, saying the Chinese driver has made his teammate Valtteri Bottas look bang average at times this season. Grid Talk podcast host Ruby Price has also praised Kevin Magnussen's performances at Haas, with Miami being a particular highlight for the Dane. And Carl King of the Monkey Seat podcast has also praised the pair at Haas. We'd love to hear your suggestions, so tell me in the comments, tell us in the comments who you think has stood out this season for you. Fraser, let's get your first choice on the board. Yeah, first choice for me is Yuki Tsunoda. I think he's had a great start to the season. Two points, which probably, or points in two races, which probably isn't the, you know, it doesn't, doesn't scream success, does it? But, you know, on the slowest car on the grid, arguably, I'd say. Uh, I think, you know, he's he's dominated his teammate, both in qualifying and in the races. 4-1 uh, in qualifying, he, he's, he's, he's ahead of De Vries. Uh, an average of three tenths of a second quicker than De Vries, I think it is, in qualifying over the course of the season, uh, over a single lap, which I think is quite impressive. You know, I think people underestimate Nick De Vries. He's the... The, an F2 champion. Uh, he's a driver who came 
fourth in the F2 Championship back in 2018 when we had George Russell, Lando Norris, Alex Albon, you know, arguably generational talents coming through. Uh, and Nick De Vries was the guy who finished behind them. So I do think Nick De Vries is a little bit underrated. I do think his performances this, this season haven't represented how good he is because I do think he's had a pretty poor start to the season, if we're being quite honest. But for Yuki to particularly in qualifying, to be 4-1 up against him, uh, to be that much quicker than him, uh, and yeah, and, and, and some of the qualifying performances he's put in, eighth in Baku, for example, uh, was pretty spectacular, in my opinion, as we've said, in the slowest car on the grid, arguably. And his races as well, you know, we saw in Miami, there were some great moves uh, around the outside, for example, in Miami. Um, and yeah, I just, for me, Yuki Tsunoda has been someone that has really stood out for me this season. He had an awful lot of expectation coming into this season. You know, Pierre Gasly has moved on. He becomes the lead driver, the more experienced driver within the team. Uh, and it was a role that some people, I think, were doubting him, whether or not he, he could do that role. He could, he could be the team leader, or would Nick De Vries come in and be the team leader? So, yeah, I think Yuki Tsunoda has, has, has really, really grown this season, really developed uh, to a point where some people are even saying, you know, he could be the, the person that ends up at Red Bull next. And uh, that's uh, maybe the, the dreaded seat alongside Max Verstappen but um, yeah it'd be really interesting if he did get that promotion I don't think he will just yet but um, yeah no a solid start to the season absolutely for me so yeah Yuki Snow is my first pick as well so uh, it, I, I reassure the viewers and listeners we definitely haven't cross-referenced yeah. these beforehand um, but yeah the, the, he's got nearly three tenths of a second on De Vries in qualifying I think he beat him by three quarters of a second in uh, Bahrain um, obviously, you can't compare Baku because De Vries crashed out. Um, but that Baku qualifying session for the Grand Prix, Yuki got into Q3 with an excellent uh, session there. And he's thoroughly outshone De Vries. And honestly, I thought De Vries was a highly rated driver coming into this season. He's a Formula 2 champion. We know uh, the caliber of driver that comes through that championship. And we're seeing it again this year. You know, lots of talented drivers ready to win that championship. And he's also won the Formula E Championship, which, you know, for people who follow Formula E, it's very, very competitive. And they used a system where they severely handicapped the top drivers in the championship standings, at least, in qualifying. And he still came through to be champion. And Sonoda's done a brilliant job. He needed to step up his game this year. And I was reading on the Formula One website earlier today that his relationship with Gasly last year, they were almost too friendly so he wouldn't get into like work mode and this year he knows that he's got to knuckle down and basically he's he's putting in the levels of effort i say the levels of effort but the level of uh, effort to his his job that he needs to do he's not just relying on gasly's setup and, and stuff like that because gasly was very good at setting up the car and now we're seeing the fruits of what yuki snowder really can deliver the Yuki Tsunoda that we expected to get in a lot of 2021, bar you know the, the Bahrain Grand Prix and Abu Dhabi, where he had very strong results. And we're seeing this potential Red Bull driver. It's very early to be talking about him moving into a Red Bull seat, but you know, it wouldn't be Red Bull without Helmut Marco declaring after five races that an Alpha Tauri driver driving well could get into the Red Bull team. So, you know, some things will never change. I, we've had rumours swirling around over the last week or so that, you know, Daniel Ricciardo, he's there, he's had a seat fitting at Red Bull and Alpha Tauri. Uh, and I'm pretty sure that, you know, that is just procedure. That is that, you know, if if he's needed at Red Bull or Alpha Tauri due to illness or injury, that, you know, he'll jump into that seat. Uh, and I don't think Nick De Vries is under as much pressure as what people are saying. However, that being said, if that was to be the case and we were to see Daniel Ricciardo jump into the Alpha Tauri alongside Yuki Tsunoda to replace Nick De Vries uh, from the summer onwards, for example, I would absolutely love to see Yuki Tsunoda go up against Daniel Ricciardo, a very established, well-known name, uh, you know, driving back at Red Bull or the, 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 you know, the junior team as such, uh, but back at the home where he first started. And for Yuki Tsunoda to, to really, that's, that, that's a real benchmark, that's a real statement. If he goes and, and beats Daniel Ricciardo over 11, 12 races at the end of the season, I think that's a huge statement by Yuki Tsunoda. So I don't think it will happen. I think Nick, Nick DeVries is... Uh, 
seat is safe. I know those uh, rumours have been swirling around, but I would love to see it happen. Daniel Ricciardo in that Alpha Tauri, if you snow the Daniel Ricciardo up against each other, I think that would be yeah, pretty yeah, pretty mouthwatering if you ask me. I was just thinking about you saying like eleven, twelve races, thinking that's like hot, that's like most of the season, and realizing no, that's like half the season now because there's so many races, it's it's ridiculous. But you raise a really good point. That would be a real marker for for Sonoda. And, you know, if you, if you can flip it the other way, if Ricardo comes in and you've got Sonoda doing really well and Ricardo just comes and beats him, you know, what, obviously that doesn't look very good for Sonoda, but that looks really good for Ricardo. It goes, OK, actually, it might have just been that he really wasn't suited to the McLaren and the way it drove. So it would give us a lot of information as to how Ricardo fits back into the driver market and a few races in, in the Alpha Tauri could be the saving of his F1 career or the death of it. So very, very interesting prospect there. But I believe he was only in Italy for a wedding. <laughs> so <laughs> how the F1 rumour mill turns. It's crazy, isn't it? What a crazy world of F1. Yeah. So let's move on to your second choice because we've, we've matched on... Uh, the first choice, give us your second driver who stood out this season. Yeah, my second driver that has stood out for me this season is Pierre Gasly. Um, Pierre Gasly, um, purely because, you know, it's his first season at Alpine. I don't, don't get me wrong, I don't think he set the world alight. However, I do think he's had a really strong start, a solid start, should we say, to his Alpine career. There's been a couple of races where he's been you know, running well inside the top 10, inside the top five at two races on two occasions this season in Australia um, and in Miami as well. Um, and, you know, if it wasn't for, for that red flag, the infamous red flag now in, the, in Australia, he would have got a top five finish there, which would have been an incredible achievement. Um, in Miami, I know he dropped back a little bit, but, you know, to be running inside, the top five and to qualify like he did I think was really really impressive um, and he's been un un unfortunate as well in qualifying on a couple of occasions obviously Bahrain starting from the back of the grid Baku he had a, an awful weekend in Baku but you know he scored more points than his teammate so far this season uh, which Esteban Ocon you know he's a he's a very quick driver we know he's a very quick driver he beat Fernando Alonso uh, up against him head to head last season in the Alpine so Ocon himself is no is no slouch um, and Pierre Gasly is beating him so far this season and I think he will grow into that role into that team I think you know we're, we're still to see the best of Pierre Gasly in that Alpine um, so yeah no really really excited to see what he can do for the second half of the season I don't think he was given a fair opportunity at Red Bull and up against the teammate killer that is Max Verstappen was he ever gonna you know stand a chance really um, so yeah no I think this is a, a really good opportunity for Pierre Gasly I said it pre-season uh, in, in Alpine a team that suits him a team that he feels comfortable in up against a really good driver in Esteban Ocon and I think he's done really well so far this season so um, yeah yeah, that Pierre Gasly for me, that driver number two. I hadn't considered either of the Alpine drivers. That's a really good shout. You, 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 I, I, I don't want to be patronising, but you've made the case really well. You've actually sort of summed up his season really nicely. Um, he has done a very, very good job. And Alpine have been blasted by their CEO this week. So, um, But the problem for Alpine, I find, is there's so few points now on offer because... If the top four teams all finish, then you've got six teams scrapping over three points in ninth and tenth. You know, that's so difficult. So they've got to, you know, like, like they have uh, the last couple of races, race well, be in the top five, not crash into each other. And, you know, in Miami, they scooped a double points finish. So that was a really good result for them. I've gone with Nico Hulkenberg for my second pick because Hulkenback 4.0, whatever number we're on now, he has out-qualified Kevin Magnussen. This is a Kevin Magnussen who took pole position in Brazil. Both, both drivers at Haas have their only pole position at Sao Paulo. There's a fun fact. In uh, dry, wet conditions as well. So, 12 years apart. Yeah. <laughs> They've got something in common. But... The Hulk has outqualified uh, the Dane four to five this season with an average uh, advantage of about a quarter of a second, which shows that even at 35 years old, he's still got that, that turn of pace 
over one lap. And obviously the Haas probably really suits his driving style over a single lap. His race performances haven't been quite as strong. In Bahrain, he had a bit of damage with uh, front wing on the opening lap. But he showed in Australia that that race craft, that, that rustiness hadn't got to it. And the battle with Lando Norris was just sublime for a few laps. And that was a bit of a, a dull race up to that point in terms of all the action on track. Um, there was an interesting battle towards the front with Alonso trying to compete with Hamilton. But in terms of actual wheel-to-wheel -wheel battle, that was about as good as it got in that race. And it, it showed that the the new newly profiled turn uh, 12, I think it is now, maybe 11, what the first of the double rights at the end of the lap, um, you can overtake there. It does work. It, it is beneficial to the action. And he's got 300% more points than Kevin Magnussen after five races. I mean, it's six versus two, but... Oh, and I have to say, Nico Hulkenberg is my third pick as well. So we've uh, we've agreed on another one there. Um, yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. You know, I think he's had a really strong start to the season. Six points so far this season in a Haas that, in my opinion, has no right to be near the sharp end of the grid most weekends. And he's been up there. He's been there or thereabouts most weekends. Um, this season, particularly in qualifying, we all know he's a one lap specialist uh, or has has grown to be. You know, we saw it in in COVID where he he stepped into the, the, the racing point at the time in Silverstone and qualified third behind the Mercedes. And, you know, after no, no, no preparation at all, you know, so we know how good he is in qualifying. But to, you know, to step in after a few years out to be leading his teammate 4-1 in qualifying, to be beating him on points in the races, as you say, six points to two, I think is a really, really you know, strong showing from Hulkenberg. Um, and again, I think he's just going to grow into the season, you know, once he's up and running. Fitness-wise, you know, as you say, 35 years old, I, I, I'm sure he's not at his uh, peak fitness, if you like. Um, and, you know, it does take time to, to, to build race fitness as well, you know. We talk about match fitness in football and, and, and other sports. Race fitness is a thing as well, right? Your neck and your everything else that goes with being a racing driver. And, and I, I've, you know, you... Five races in, maybe he's there or thereabouts now. But I definitely don't think race one, race two, race race three of the of the season uh, that he would have been a hundred percent fit and, and 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 ready to go. We then had a big break uh, between uh, Melbourne and Baku, uh, which I'm sure wouldn't have helped any of the drivers' fitness. So you know, I think I think once he, he's he's up and running, he's got his eye back in, which I'm sure he has already. But um, I, I just think he's going to get better and better as the season goes on. He's had a really strong start to the season, and I think that's. A strong driver pairing as well, you know, Nico Hulkenberg, Kevin Magnussen. I think um, between the two of them, they've got the right amount of experience, pace, uh, one lap uh, pace as well um, to, to really get some points to maximise Haas's weekend. You know, I, I think Haas are a team that they're not necessarily going to be competing for the points every single weekend. But with those two drivers, I think they'll know that they've got the maximum out of that package every single weekend. So, yeah, Nico Hulkenberg, pick number three for me. And I absolutely agree with, with what you said. It's interesting you say that this is a, it's a strong driver lineup. It's almost a, you know, a one-upmanship, isn't it? Whoever gets the better of the other. Because they're both proven talents in the midfield. So whoever comes out on top looks really good because it's not like they've beaten a, a pay driver. Um, you know, if you take Alonso and Stroll, for example, Stroll is an adequately good racing driver, but he's probably not going to be the world champion that Fernando is trying to make him out to be. So how good is Fernando still? We don't really know. Obviously, he's doing a very good job. So with Hulkenberg, he's coming back to face Magnussen, who's in a similar position to him. An extra year in terms of his return under his belt and a year less out of the sport so it's an interesting comparison to see how they match up against each other and the one that pace is, is still there and that, that doesn't necessarily require the fitness like you said because you, you can just go all out on it and then you go back to the garage and get a rub down in in the physio room but 58 laps of a grand prix that takes a lot of effort concentration on the neck i mean well, these cars are maybe not quite as physical as maybe back in the, the 90s and the 2000s, but they're still very heavy to drive. So for, for Nico to come back in and, and be doing the job he is, I think, like we've said, is is really excellent and a testament to him. 
And that, that is your third and final pick. So, so far, we've matched on two drivers. We've got one so far difference, and this is going to be the second difference. I've gone with my third pick for Alex Albon at Williams. Um, when I thought of this podcast concept, two drivers sprang to mind, Sonoda and Albon, and I, I had to go fishing around for my third one a little bit. Um, but Albon was one that sprang to mind immediately. The Williams has improved this season, but I think Albon has improved even further with his his just general approach to the weekend. He, he looks much more complete now. If you think back to his time in the Red Bull, he was almost a little bit scatty. He would be there one session, then he wouldn't be, then he'd have a 20-lap a stint where he looked really good, but then... You know, Hamilton would punt him off or something crazy would happen to him. Um, he's doing a really excellent job. He's 5-0 up against Logan Sargent in qualifying. So Logan hasn't got his feet under the table yet, that's for sure. But Albon can only beat what he's up against in the other car, and he's doing just that. He's regularly in the top 10, whether it be in qualifying or in the race. Really, he should have more than the one point that he picked up in Bahrain. I mean, he was running, what, P6 in Australia before he crashed. If he'd got to the end of that race, that would have been a huge amount of points for Williams. And that would have been that might have been their season made. Um, and he did say that in Baku, that was one of his strongest weekends. And as I was researching for this, he, he said that he had some damage to his front wing early on in that race, which made it even more impressive because you had to make sure you obviously didn't crash into the wall. And we know how easy it is to crash into the, to the wall there. Just ask... Charles Leclerc, he, he does that a lot there. Um, so, yeah, your thoughts on Alex Albon? Yeah, again, a really good pick, Aaron, and, and one that crossed my mind as well. I think Alex has had a really good season, hasn't he? A quietly good season, I would say. Uh, Melbourne is the one that stands out, the race that stands out. Oh, yeah, as you say, running inside the top six um, in a Williams is... Is you know is pretty extraordinary, isn't it? So um, I, yeah, I think he's, he's he's a really strong pick. I think he's made Logan Sargent look perhaps a little bit worse than what he is. I I you know we we watch Formula Two, Aaron, and I'm sure some of the listeners too as well. And we know how good a driver Logan Sargent is. You know he's he's not a bad driver by any stretch of the imagination. And Alex Albon has made Logan Sargent you know look a little bit silly in that Logan he's been that far ahead of Logan Sargent this season, right? And uh, yeah, as I said, I, I, we we really rate Logan Sargent as. As a driver, right? So uh, I think that the, in general, the the field this season is just such a strong grid. Um, and you know, you look at um, the, the the two drivers that probably haven't necessarily um, stood out this season are Nick De Vries and Logan Sargent. Two drivers that have done very well in the junior categories. Two drivers that have uh, you know gone away, or you know, particularly with um, uh, with Nick De Vries, he's gone away. He's done a, a Formula E championship. Logan Sargent had to do a second year in Formula Three after battling Oscar Piastri for the for the championship. Who's someone that you know we know that you know Oscar Piastri has a great start to the season. Probably unlucky not to be mentioned in this podcast. Um, but he's doing a quietly good job uh, and, uh, you know, yeah, not too far off Orlando of Norris. Um, but, yeah, just the, the, in general, the, the, the quality of the drivers on the grid this season is very strong. And when we, you know, we've had the last couple of races, but Baku and Miami maybe haven't been the most exciting races. I think it's to do with the quality of the drivers that are on the grid. We, we don't have a Nicholas Latifi or a Nikita Mazepin who are putting it in the wall sometimes in a race weekend. Right, which means that we don't have any, we don't have as many safety cars. You know, Miami, we didn't see a single yellow flag. There wasn't as much drama because we're having drivers that are, 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 are real quality drivers. It's, it's, in my opinion, the best grid we've ever seen in Formula One in terms of quality. Uh, and yeah, maybe it means that you know, over the course of a race weekend, it's not as entertaining because no one's putting it in the wall. Um, but um, yeah, so sorry, I've gone off piece a little bit there, but um, you know that. Talk, talking about how you know Alex Albon has had a great start to the season, he has made Logan Sargent make, you know look uh, a little bit silly at times, but that's that's a that's a, a compliment to Alex Albon about how well he's driving rather than how bad Logan Sargent has been because he hasn't been bad at all. So uh, yeah, Alex Albon, well done. I think the point you raise about the quality of the grid is actually really important to this whole conversation because to be standing out 
without being in one of the top cars is in this depth of quality difficult to do but these uh five drivers five hang on one two three four five yeah <laughs> I had to count there for a second uh, five drivers that we've chosen um or is it four no it's four it is four it's four. uh sonoda holkenberg gasly and albon look at that i can't count it's friday <laughs> we're recording this on friday we've had a long week at work let us off just me because fraser obviously can't count <laughs> Yeah, I, I had to get my fingers out to count now. I was counting on my finger. For anyone that's uh, listening, audio uh, audio listeners, I was counting on my fingers there. One, two, three, four. Yeah, it was four, yeah. <laughs> it's Friday, let us off. <laughs> so yeah, these four drivers have really done well to stand out and put their heads above the parapet in such a really high quality grid and also a, a high quality grid that's very close together if you're not in a Red Bull. So you've got... The, the group behind Red Bull of Mercedes, Ferrari and Aston Martin, who are all fairly similar. If you took Red Bull out of the equation, F1 2023 is probably the most competitive championship you've ever seen in the sport. And then behind that, they're all scrapping, like I said, over just three points or maybe a, an eighth place ahead of that. If one of the like Stroll in Miami didn't get into Q2, so he was way out of position and he didn't come back through the field. So there was an extra space on offer in the points. But for these drivers to be performing really well in that quality of grid really says a lot about them, the job they're doing in their teams. And they're doing it for different reasons as well, which is I think is really important. So for Sonoda, obviously he's needed to step up to, to essentially save his seat. Hulkenberg's making a comeback. Albon is on a bit of a redemption arc. Gasly is finding his feet outside of the Red Bull family. So... There's lots of different stories going on, but we, we just have to look a little bit deeper. There is excitement in F1 2023. Just have to find it. Just. Just. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I, I certainly hope that... Uh, I, you're right with the, 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 you know, the top three aside from Red Bull, if you like. It's, uh, it is really exciting, isn't it? I, I don't know if I'd say the most exciting ever. I think I'd say the most exciting since 2012, definitely. Um, but um, yeah, it's, uh, it is really competitive and we just need Red Bull to slip back a little bit, don't we? Just to give, just in, you know, touching different uh, distance to, to Mercedes, Ferrari and Aston Martin. And uh, yeah, we've got a, a great season on our hands if that is the case, haven't we? So. Well, Mercedes are bringing some upgrades to um, hopefully some side pods to uh, Imola next week. So we'll see what that can do. Toto Wolf says it's not going to be a huge game changer, but we've seen him play things down before and they've turned up with a rocket ship. Um, switching our attention away from Formula One, but also to Imola next weekend. Formula Two heads to Imola. Obviously the circuit where it first ran back in the days as GP2. So always a special moment for the, the, the series to go back there. Who should we be watching out for in FIA Formula 2 at Imola this weekend? God, good question, Aaron. The, the, again, the quality of the driver drivers and the grid in, in Formula 2 this season is astounding. And you look at the, the results so far, six different winners. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been an amazing season so far. If you're not into Formula 2, definitely go and check it out because it's been absolutely incredible. Uh, who to look out for? Um, if you go off of practice or for testing even that's been happening over the last three days, you've got to say Jack Doohan and his uh, fight back, if you like. From, he's had a, a bit of a shock of the uh, start of the season. I don't think he'll mind me saying uh, because uh, it, it certainly hasn't been good. Um, for, well, not, he, he hasn't been as good as we know he is. We're saying it's not a good start to the season because we know how good he is and his uh, results haven't necessarily lived up to that quality that we've seen. So, yeah, I, I hope I hope to see Jack Doohan having a really strong weekend and to get him back back on form because I think having him in the title uh, race would be really good for Formula 2 as well. Um, obviously, you've got uh, you know, Uyumu Owasso, who's had a great start to the season. Uh, you've got Frederick Vesti, who's been the most consistent driver perhaps this, this season. Teo Porsche, championship leader. He'll, all, he'll be there or thereabouts. He's been uh, the most consistent driver driver this season hasn't qualified outside the top three yet uh, which is uh, the consistency that you need to to win the formula two championship so he's going about his business quietly 
and you know Oli Behrman winning the both races in Baku, the double last time out uh, was absolutely incredible. Something we haven't seen or we don't see very often. Um, and he'll be riding a wave of confidence. So I think he'll be, um, yeah, definitely one to watch as well. And had a good test as well, had a quite a good test. So, yeah, I, I, you know, Formula 2 is so competitive. Absolutely, you know, love it. This is, if you want to see some real good racing, watch Formula 2 because it's a lot closer than what Formula 1 is at the moment. Uh, all of those drivers will be, um, will be competitive, of course they will, uh, but the, knowing how competitive Formula 2 is, the fact that I've listed all of those drivers means that it'll be completely, you know, someone different. Uh, so it could be Kush Miney, it could be, I don't know, absolutely anyone. So uh, yeah, no, really looking forward to Formula 2 being back on our screens and uh, seeing what antics occur. It was quite wild at Imola last year, Roy Nassani took the lead from six on the grid and was set to win and crashed. <laughs> So he did. He did. Um, yeah, anything can happen in Formula Two. And on the Oli Behrman doing the double, I was so I wasn't disappointed, but I was frustrated that he won the the sprint race because I was doing the report for Inside F two for the feature race, and obviously he started from pole position. I thought oh, it'd be so good to to write the report about his first win, and then he goes and wins the sprint race. Obviously, you know. I'm, so delighted for him because I love seeing British drivers do well. Yeah, I have a bit of British bias. It's just national pride and that's fine. I'm, I'm sure any other country would be doing the same for their drivers. So it was so good to see him. And then he went and did the double. It was just absolutely incredible. Topping every session. That that was superb from him. But yeah, Jack Dew and I tipped him for the, the title this year and uh, I feel really good about that right now. Yeah, Aaron, I, you know, you're usually pretty good at predictions, but uh, that hasn't quite materialised like you'd expected, right? So uh... it really hasn't. I mean, my predictions for the Miami Grand Prix were spot on in terms of my podium picks, um, but obviously not pre-season uh, with F2. Tell us a little bit more about the F2 show then, Fraser. You've interviewed recently the Rodin Carlin pair of Enzo Fittipaldi and Zayn Maloney as well as VAR's J.M. Carrera. You did know who he was, didn't you? I did know who he was, yeah, which is a good start to the podcast and the interview. So, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, listen, J.M. is a great guy. His his story is absolutely amazing. What he's been through, the the tragedy of, of what happened in Spa 2019, uh, and the, the comeback journey that he has been on is absolutely exceptional. Um, a great, a great, you know, athlete, uh, an even better person, uh, and it was uh, it was fascinating to sit down with him and talk about all things Formula Two, the difference in the cars that, that you know since back then when he was driving to to, to where he is now, the journey he's been on. Uh, definitely go and check that out if you uh, if you haven't done so already on uh, Inside F Two uh, social medias on YouTube and uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, but yeah, so yeah, that was that was JM talking about his his season so far. We've also had, as you say, Zane Maloney, Enzo Fittipaldi, the, the Carlin boys uh, on the podcast as well. Um, it was really good to sit down with them. That was a really fun interview, actually. They're they're great lads, great characters. Um, you know, maybe not necessarily had the start of the season that they'd like to have had, um, but both very honest about you know their their their, their difficulties, uh, and they also answered uh, whether or not pizza, uh, pineapple on pizza, should be a thing or not, uh, which is a question from yourself, Aaron, wasn't it? So uh, definitely promoted a bit of conversation. If you want to know the answers to that, again, go and check it out on our Inside F2 YouTube, YouTube uh, or Inside F2 or wherever you get your your podcasts. Uh, but um, yeah, two really good interviews, really happy to to have sat down with them and hopefully that's not the only drivers we'll speak to this season so uh yeah no really enjoyed that yeah they, they were a really good pair of interviews the, the one with jm was really insightful i thought that was really good you had uh did you have chris mccarthy on with that one as well we did indeed had yeah formula three commentator fracker commentator uh, chris mccarthy on uh, and he asked some some really good questions as well um and uh, it's always it's always good to have knowledgeable people on podcasts and that's why we get aaron harper on most weeks on the f2 show um so uh, yeah so no it's really, really good <laughs> <laughs> yeah chris chris did a really good job there it's always good to have lots of knowledge on the podcast and the, like you said, the one with Enzo and Zayn was a really fun interview. 
the questions were quite light and you got to see them sort of play off against each other in like a, a slightly more informal way, which was quite cool because obviously they're teammates, but they're there for themselves. So they, but they're there to have fun on a podcast and the questions were good fun. So really, really good. I can't stress enough how uh, much everyone should go and listen to the Inside F2 show hosted by Fraser Ford. Um, that's all for today. My thanks to Fraser for joining me. Um, where can we find you on social media if you are in the cesspool that is social media? <laughs> I am indeed. Um, you can find me at underscore FraserFord1 on Instagram, on Twitter. Uh, I don't do TikTok to be... I do have a TikTok account, Aaron, but I don't really use it, to be honest with you. Uh, so, yeah, go, go and check me out on uh, on, on Instagram and, and, and Twitter. Probably Twitter is my... Uh, my motorsport outlet, if you like. I tweet a little bit about motorsport. I don't put too much on Instagram, to be fair, but uh, if you want to go check that out, you can as well. So that's where you can find me. Excellent. You can find me at AHGP Pod uh, for the podcast stuff. You can find me, Aaron Harper41, uh, for a little bit more personal stuff and a little bit more to do with my work. Um, but thank you to everyone for listening. Remember to like the video if you are watching the video. It uh, really helps the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe for more Grand Prix content. And thanks very much for watching. <laughs>